live stream. It's happening. This meeting is being live streamed. It's live stream happening. And then I want Zoom to bring up the stuff. Good morning, everyone. It's Friday. It's long weekend day here in, oh, I got to mute this tab because it's me talking. Uh, it's, it's the long weekend here in Victoria. We're June. So July 1st is Canada Day, where we celebrate Canada, which is the noble country that I live in. I don't know for noble. It feels noble to me. Good morning. I've been enjoying an entire month off. Before we go much further, I have to talk about this shirt, which is linen, which is nice. So I'm pretty sure I'm not going to keep it. And here's why. It's got a weird pull where this placket, I think this is called a placket, pulls to the right like that. And then it looks like I'm wearing a shirt from one of those shitty future movies like Time Cop or uh, Universal Soldier or Cyborg, where everyone like is mostly the same, except they wear slightly shittier fashion and stuff looks slightly shittier. You guys know the movies I'm talking about. It's like they were like, in the future, things will be boxier. Instead of more sleek, we're going to make things boxier. Boxiness is the future. So yeah, this shirt's doing weird stuff. I don't know. I think it's going to have to be uh, let go of. I needed to mention that because it was driving me bonkers. And if I didn't address it, if I didn't address what was in the space for me, then none of us were going to be able to enjoy this show. It was going to just suck. So I've been off for a month, more or less. Um, typically, when we're off, we would do some vacation, vacationing. But we've been traveling quite a bit lately. Um, the following weekend, I'm taking uh, my mom away for her birthday. The weekend after that, we're down at Rhythmia in Costa Rica. I've got a couple clients coming with me, and I'm working down there. So uh, this June felt good to not, not do a lot of traveling, to just be at home, to relax, to spend time with friends. So we've done a lot of that, played some pickleball, went to a wedding in Colorado, and most importantly, a new Street Fighter came out, finally. And um, there's very few things I like in the world more than like Magic the Gathering and Pickleball, but playing fighting games and specifically Street Fighter is one of them. So I've been spending a lot of time, a lot of late nights playing Street Fighter. And because of the way that I like to do things, because of the passion that I am, I've been reading a lot of strategy. See, look, it's doing that thing. Reading a lot of strategy, watching a lot of videos, practicing a lot. I don't like to halfway do it. I like to really lean into it. And then we've been taking on projects around the house, selling stuff that's piled up that we need to get rid of. I'm in the process right now of, I don't want to mess it all up, of reorganizing all of my magic cards. So as you can tell on the video, that's a huge box. Hey, America. Build. Build, I say. Not currently, but filled with magic cards. And having a collection of Magic the Gathering cards is quite a thing because each of these little cards has a casting cost and you want to order them so you can find them. And so this has kind of been like a library. Uh, the last couple of days have been a bit librarian-esque where I'm putting stuff into order. And anyhow, none of that's that interesting. Um, the last thing I'll say about my break is that I've been heavily resistant to any kind of like uh, imposition on my schedule. So there's a part of me that likes to be a bit of a teenager when it comes to time off. I like to stay up late and wake up without an alarm clock. And when I've had things scheduled in the morning to do, I've been very resistant, very resentful that there's been something on my calendar and I have to go to bed at a reasonable time and all of that. So what I find is really important for me during this time off is that I really empower that. The rest of my life is very structured. I, I get up very regularly. I go to bed very regularly. I have specific things that I do throughout the morning. I'm very like, I have a lot of structure because that supports me to take on all of the stuff that I'm committed to taking on. But the counterpart to that is that I have to give time for that part of me that's like, fuck you structure. I'm just going to I'm going to play. I want to just relax and not do anything so I can empower my structure. I can empower that stuff when I'm giving myself time off. If I don't let myself kind of be a little bit messy during these months off, during my vacations, during my breaks, then what happens is it starts to get all tangled up. Then I start to be like, ah, I start to fight the structure I create during the rest of my normal life, if you like, and then it, it all becomes a mess. 
So it's really important for me to give myself that spaciousness. Okay. Um, let's talk about our guest today. So we're going to have Allison Garner on the show. Um, Allison's hilarious. She's been with us in the Forge. She's coming into her fourth year. So she was, uh, she joined us after the first year we ran a leadership team and has been with us the whole time. And um, an incredible coach. Um, I, I want to let her share a lot of the story of um, how we came to know each other and stuff like that. Um, so let's do that. Allison, let's get you to take your, put your camera on, put on your mic. Hello. Hello there. How are you? I'm good. I'm doing a live show, I guess. That's awesome. And yeah, it's Friday. Yeah. So. yeah, it's Friday. I want you to uh, fix your shirt though. That's annoying. You can't tell. If I get low enough down, <laughs> then you can't see that the placard. I just put the camera. Yeah. Yeah. But this might, this shirt might be soon to be donated because mm. you can't, I can't. I don't know if you have this, but like I've tried, I was raised in like a family where you don't waste anything. Great uh -huh. way to be raised. But then what that led to, I'd, I'd have these shirts or pants or whatever that drove me nuts. I'd be out and I'd constantly be fidgeting. And then, so then I didn't want to wear them. Yes. At first I tried to force that. That didn't work because I just felt self-conscious, annoyed. So then they would just sit in my closet forever. So nobody gets to enjoy it. Yeah, I didn't want to get rid of them because that was wasteful, but I didn't want to wear them because I didn't like it. And so eventually I've had to come to this place where some people might regard it as wasteful and, and it might even be valid, but I'm like, mm, I don't think it's any less wasteful to just have it sit taking up space in my drawer, not getting worn than to just like recognize, oh, I'm not going to wear this. I'm going to give this over to someone else. So that's, I can feel old whitey or new whitey is soon to be given to someone else. Lovely. <laughs> uh-huh, uh-huh. It was never meant for you in the first place. That's right, yeah, I was just a steward passing <laughs> it along. Linen. Uh, what's going on? How's Oshkosh treating you right now? Is it, Dude, you said it's hot at the start of this time. hot, which never yeah. happens, right? So mm. I don't know what's going on, but we usually don't get above 80. Um, I could give that to you in mm. Celsius, but it would take me a minute. It would I think like, I have a sense. That's like our 20s, I believe. 15 to 20. Yeah, something like uh -huh. that. That's kind of um, here. That would be like a nice warmer spring day, which no. sounds quite lovely. It's no, it's here. hotter than that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Gotcha. We're like yeah. probably high 80s, low 90s right now during these, yeah. these times. I, that is what it is like here. And... Mm. We also have all of the smoke from Canada. So that's been interesting. Like not being Beast. able to see, not being able to breathe. So that's been, but other than that, it's been a lovely summer. Um, it's very apocalyptic with the smoke, isn't it? Like little. it's all orange and yeah. Yeah, the sunrise is amazing. Cause it's like this blood red sun. Cause of course all the particles in the air. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I enjoy it from my closed windows and air conditioned house. Cause I don't want to breathe any of that in. So you guys don't go out? Um, not, I mean, it was, I, I have never experienced that level of haze. So when it was super mm. bad, I was out in it a little bit and noticed my, I would get really sore throat. My lungs yeah. would get a little congested. So I was like, Ugh, that doesn't feel good. So our noses it, get stuffy too. Yeah. I didn't get that. And I didn't get the headaches. People are getting headaches, but yeah. And today it looks like it's mostly moved on. Oh, it's mostly moved on. Mm, lovely. You're welcome. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> someone so out? let's talk about um, your arc. So the first place we met was for PC, right? Yes. Yeah. So what can you share about like where you were at in your coach? Maybe you can share a little bit about what for PC was, what drew you into that mm. uh, as a starting point? Sure. Um, so when I started my coaching practice, um, I didn't have a clue what I was doing. Um, mm -hmm, and in my either. previous career, I, I never had to do sales. We were, and still are the world's experts in the technology. So people knew us. So everywhere mm -hmm. in the world, if they needed help with that thing, they just called us. So I then when launched you say, my, when you say us, like you had your own business or when the I was an you engineer, with? the uh, company gotcha. I worked with. Yeah. So the three people, uh, there were three of us. Um, and we, we, well, there were like five of us, but we are the experts in BTX extraction. Mm. Uh -huh. big deal. People who have benzene, toluene, xylene extraction, it's a big deal. And they know to call right. that company. So that was a company that I worked for. So I never learned sales 
ever. Uh huh. Suddenly I'm now thrusting myself into a world where, um, I don't know how to, like, how do people find me? How do they get to know me and not knowing much of anything. So I stumbled around for a year. Um, before we go much further, let me check in then. Yeah. So what you're working at a company where you're like the foremost authority on BTX, BTX, X, BTX extraction. Yes. And then, so what even leads you to lead a job where you're comfortable, you know what you're doing to yeah. something you have no, idea. like, what's the process that goes to that? Um, I think now that I've got several years, I'm in eight years now, I, I have this gift of hindsight of looking back and being like, what was it? Right. And I think what I've, I've now come to believe, so ask me next year, it might be different. But I think <laughs> where I'm at now is um, I have this, I love to solve things. I love to solve puzzles. I love to put things together. I love to like connect dots. It's really, that's why I love science and math. And it was really mm. satisfying for the way that I'm wired. So it just made sense that I would always go into something that would be high tech of some sort. Right. And so I get out into the world of engineering and I get into design and we're doing revamps, which are super complicated, right? You can't build a new unit anywhere in North America. Every once in a while, we mm. get a new unit like in India or Asia, but mostly it's like revamps. So you've got to like they're just really complicated and really satisfying intellectually. It's like renovating a house. Like you can't build from the ground up. You have to fit bolt into the existing structure. That's the idea, right? Yes, exactly. Uh -huh, okay. Okay. So you're doing that. So I'm doing that. It's really complicated, intellectually stimulating. I'm super satisfied that way. And everything's perfect. Of, Couldn't ask for more in life. <laughs> ah, 2.2 .2 children. Yeah. So at some point I'm doing, I, we also did troubleshooting. So I had done enough designs and revamps that I was then coming back two, three years later because they were calling us and saying, look, this unit's not running right. So mm -hmm. you fly to wherever they are in the world and you show up and I'd done enough. I'd been in enough years where I was like, well, what happened to the project that we did three years ago? That was the solution to the problem that you're telling me about right now. And they'd be like, well, either we did it and then we undid it or we didn't mm. actually implement it at all or we implemented it and then we changed it along the way or like this. So it was we, always... with, with no experience at all. We thought by tweaking this, we could actually make it more efficient well, than what you and did. It's their unit. Like they know it yeah. better, but it's their the unit. The day, like they paid us lots of zeros to create and generate this high, high. It was a really big design really expensive, a lot of time, a lot of investment, a lot of resources. And then you go back three years later and it's not there anymore. And you're like, what, the, why? Mm. And the answer started to become really clear to me that it was always the people. It was never a bunch of morons. It bag was of idiots. people that got <laughs> for sure. So that was interesting to me uh -huh. because there was a technical problem. Mm. We gave them this beautiful technical solution my brain chemistry is like, you are amazing and this, they will love this. And then you come yeah. back a year or two later and they're like, we didn't do it or we did it. We undid it or Bobby out right. and whatever decided that he doesn't like it that way. Or these guys didn't think it worked or the plant manager did the thing or they changed our feed composition or whatever. And you're like, guys, what the mm. hell? So then I thought, okay, so then you do that enough years and you're like, what the fuck am I doing? Mm. None of these technical solutions are actually solving anything. What a right, so it's like you're you're creating a solution that's really satisfying theoretically, but it's not quite plugging not. into the ground. Yeah, gotcha. And how come? Because of right. humans, and it was almost always groups of humans, like engineers versus operators, or uh -huh. supervisors versus you know whatever the outdoor guys, or plant manager versus the sales, or. But it was always like, okay, but this like can I implement this? Can I turn, can I flip the switch? Right? Like just do the thing guys. Like that will fix it. I promise. Right. And it did, it would. And then new people would show up and then they would undo things. So that was very dissatisfying because it didn't mm. actually solve the problem. So then I was like, okay, I don't think I'm actually an engineer because I'm way too social. <laughs> that was a story I told myself uh -huh. that like these engineers are a bunch of arrogant, boring lanyard wearing, you know, and I'm not like that. Like I didn't right. seem to jive. I can work with anybody. That's when I started to really dig into like, actually, I can work with anybody. I can work with operators, engineers, plant managers, whatever. So then I thought, okay, well, what if I get over to the people side? What does that even look like? And that's when I started looking into 
like who does this work? I don't want to do HR or anything like that. But like, what does that even look like? Started to look into coaching. Then I got certified and credentialed. Bless you. So hold on. Yeah. Like so far in your story, you've, you've felt some dissatisfaction. Yes. But, and maybe that's all it took, but typically for people, there's a larger catalyst or, or the dissatisfaction builds up. So is, is it, it simply just, you're like, ah, the solution's not working. I'm going to wander off or is there, does it build up to a fever? Like what yeah. kind of reaches the breaking point? Give you a climax is what you're asking for. I got you. Please finally. <laughs> <laughs> so inside of the business that I wor was working in at the time, uh, it, it is my father's business. Aha, uh -huh, gotcha. So I'm starting to also see inside my own life. Um, I'm noticing my husband has become pretty seriously addicted to alcohol. I think things are not going well there. I quit drinking because I had a pretty unhealthy relationship with alcohol. That was mm. getting worse. I had two small children. I was in therapy. I was working with my father. There's all that complicated mess of like having a parent child relationship inside of business. And I think in the midst of all of that, not only was it dissatisfying work, there was the personal emotional side of like, holy shit, I'm, I think I might just be an engineer and I might be working for my dad because I'm still trying to get his affection and his acceptance. Mm. And I'm a 40 whatever year old person. Right. That. I don't, I can't do that anymore. I'm no see, so, longer willing. Yeah. So there's like a bunch of stuff happening, yeah. not necessarily connected to, to your job, but it's kind of like, it sounds like it's having you start to consider what you're yeah. up to. Is this actually what I? I want to do? Yeah. Gotcha. Am I really an engineer? Cause I want to be an engineer or did I do it just right. to, cause this was I was the son fit. my dad never had and all of that. Right. It's right. all feeding into the story of like, I, if I do X, Y, and Z, then my dad will do this. Mm. And I kept going and I kept going and I wasn't getting the payoff. Got it. And, and so that shit, so you, you get certified. So you're yeah. taking a step into coaching yeah. after like taking a look, figuring out what might be a fit. So is that edgy to do? Is it scary? Is there like a sort of do you have to cross the threshold of fear or is it like, yeah, whatever, I'll just, you know, lean Not into yet. this. Not yet. It, okay. Yeah. So this I did in my spare time. I did it <clears throat> while I still worked full time at the gotcha. consulting. So I was still engineering. You're kind of doing some stuff traveling. off to the side. Maybe I'll try this out. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. And so I was okay. able to work my way through that entire program, all of it while I still worked full time. Okay. Okay. And so then, then. To go ahead. And what what okay. happens next? So then the edgy part is like, I get to a certain level I'm of the first credential. It's like a hundred hours of paid coaching or something. And I'd gotten up to 60 paid hours. Uh huh. So you're already like, getting paid a little bit for yeah. your work. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. So I get over the 60 people all while I'm still working full time at this other company. Uh -huh. And I'm like, I could totally do this. I'm over halfway. Like I'm going to get my hundred and it's just going to keep going. Right. So the edgy thing was to then talk to the company, my father specifically, and say, I'm going to leave. Mm. So that was that edgy, not well. Uh -huh. um, he, he is a, um, he will, he, he's really good at saying the thing in the moment. Yeah. He's, he's also really good at lying. And so I think mm. he, he basically lied to my face that night, probably to protect himself, probably for a lot of reasons. But he said like, you know, good luck to you. And I think there was a bit of like smirk, like mm. just let us know if you know you ever want go to go ahead and enjoy fucking up your life, and we'll see you in a yes. year, kind of that yeah. kind of thing. Yeah. Uh -huh. And and um, we'll see. So so then I did. I left and I launched, which like nothing happens, right? You just decide that's yeah. the last. So anticlimactic. And then yeah. you're like at your house, like yeah, yeah, so, got it. So, so you, and at this point you've, you've pushed the canoe away from the dock, so to speak, you're not working at all in the consulting practice. Yes. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yeah. Okay. So, so I think we're caught up now. This is where we connect in 4PC. Is that right? Well, then I have my, then I have a year where I uh, made, right. okay. I made 6,000 something dollars and my mm. husband was like, that's cute. <laughs> so like now you go get a, you get a job. Cause like, and what was your expectation for that year? 
60. Got it. I don't know. Okay. I didn't like, I didn't know. I was like, somehow this grows, right? <laughs> Without me not, I didn't know how to grow business. I didn't know how to do sales. I didn't know about marketing and networking and all of that. It's not that I didn't know, like I'm not an idiot, but I also had no like system in place because I had never had to do that in my entire career. Uh-huh. So and there's, there's like a real, um, that, that word you use system is really important because I see it go two ways. Like one is that people, we just don't know even what to do. Like systematically, we don't like, oh, I need to talk to this many people. I need to go to a networking event or I need right. to do something right. every week or every couple of weeks right? or a wine or something. Like we just need to, we don't have anything, any structure at all. So then we do stuff sort of sporadically and yes. it kind of works, but you yes. never build the momentum. Yes. Right. So you're, I guess, would you say like floundering a bit in this first 100%. year? 100%. Yeah, uh -huh. floundering. I, oh God, I joined B and I. Have you ever uh, gone yes. to one of those meetings? Is that a business networking something? International. Oh, nice. Oh, international makes it it's, so, it's so it's much like better. The sleaziest of the sleazy meetings, right? We're like, you. It's so bad. Anyways, I I went. I actually joined for two years, and it, the thing I got from that was like, at least I could do an elevator pitch because we had to practice every week. So it was so all much bad. that, isn't it? Yeah. But that's all it is, right? Yes. Yeah. So, anywho. So now I did a, I got just to, to interject there, I did a, a part of a networking group, a pretty good one. Um, and one of the guys is like a pitch master or whatever. And yes. so by the point I joined, I was long past. It's not that I'm better than it just that's just not where I'm playing anymore. Yeah. But he was taking people through the pitch and it was like um, his vibe was instead of saying like what I do is blah, 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 blah. You, you bring people into a story. It should be like, you know those people that are really successful, but feel blah, 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 blah. Well, this is how I, and it's kind of like a fairly good idea, but it was still like, uh, okay, this, this is good for people that have like never worked with this before, but yeah. So anyhow, you, yeah. you do, you, you master your pitch over the course of this year. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And then, um, I panic because mm. I've made nothing. And yeah. um, <clears throat> I had the book, I went back to the, the, um, the coaching school that I went to. And which I one was that, by the way? ICA, which is International ICA, Coach okay. Academy. And I went into their bulletin board and I was like, does anybody know, like, does anybody need books or any like resources at this point? And somebody had said to me, it was somebody inside that program that reached out and said, Rich Litvin has this book called Prosperous Coach. You mm. might find it useful. So I bought the book, I read the book, and then I was like, I wonder if he has like a website, right? So then I go yeah. and I start to wander in, and that's how I got into Rich Lithman's world is he had at that time the salon, which was the a salon, right? The salon, the six month program to, you know, whatever X times your current thing I'm about. Fancy Fine. dazzle kind of yeah, conversation. There's a lot of lights yeah. and, and bells and whistles. Uh -huh. And I joined that program and had no money for it. And, you know, my husband's like, really? So you've made no money and now you're going to put more money. And I'm like, I know. And if he's a charlatan, then this is going to be really embarrassing. But let me try a little more. And so my husband's like, yeah. okay, cool. Let's, you know, whatever. So I did that. And, and before we go further, the book you're referring to is The Prosperous Coach, right? Co-written yes. by him and Steve Chandler? Correct. Uh-huh. Got it. Okay. So then I got into that program and then it was during one of our, yeah, or was it the intensive? I can't remember, but the system was you're in LA, you're at one of the fancy hotels in Santa Monica, and there's an envelope, secret envelope that shows up. Not everybody gets one. Mm. Brilliant, right? Brilliant mm -hmm. marketing. So now yeah. it's like an exclusive and I got one and I was invited to a dinner that evening with these people who are the top 4% mm. in the coaching industry. Right. And I was like, who the fuck would turn that down? Like, why uh, so would this would have been an intensive. I, I remember when he rolled this out. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So, so you I think did the, the intensive salon was first included and then... in the uh -huh. salon. Yeah. So I did the salon and then I did, I, I decided to do the, the intensive after the salon. Yeah. Then I get the special envelope and then I go to the, the golden dinner. ticket. Uh huh. I'm telling you, it's great marketing. So I show up there. You were not at that. Um, but I'm I was surprised. Really I don't remember you put it that way. I remember, well, it doesn't matter. So I joined 4PC. So now <laughs> I've made more money and yet not enough to afford 4PC. So, so let I me go, put a few things in yeah. for people. So uh, Rich Lippin, 
And Steve Chandler co-wrote a great book called The Prosperous Coach. Rich Livin, very uh, brilliant, magnetic, charming individual, as Allison's sharing, really, really um, sharp with his marketing. Yes. I don't mean that yes. negatively or derogatorily, just he's, he's got a good head for it. And yeah. so he does those sort of things. Um, Bay and I had gone to an intensive. We joined when he first introduced this concept of 4PC. It was less about him and the work he was delivering and more about the fact that there were people in the room we were in um, proposing like $50,000 packages. And we were just yes. like, I don't even understand how that's possible. And yeah. they're not that well-trained as a coach. We can just feel it, but they're doing that. Yeah. So I, I'm almost certain I was at that event because I was at all those events from the very start when he first rolled it out. But anyhow, yeah. so you see that you're like, oh, wow, that's something. So when you join the salon, it sounds like you, you earned some more money. Yeah. So then that year I got up to, into the thirties and I was like, okay, there we go. Now I can imagine and see, like I can double a few more mm, times. So it made like a I, difference. I can imagine it made a mass, like Rich Litvin's mm. program literally saved my business. And what and do you it, attribute that to? Like, what was it that, that, you learned or started doing differently or what, what made the difference there? So he had a system, uh -huh. a great fucking system. Like it is four steps and it is so doable. And it's such, it's so aligned with mm. the way I am that I was like, you mean I don't have to like have a sales funnel and I don't have to do Facebook ads and I don't have to do videos and I don't have to do all these things. I can yeah. just talk to people and serve them. In a this was the prosperous coach yes, system. Four step right? process. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So um, the system for me was um, that's what really attracted me was the system. Then I implement the system and now I'm doing the system and I've got all these things that are popping up. And so each week or every other week, however often we met, we would bring that in. Like, well, here's something mm. that happened. I don't know what to do with. Here's something. And there were 10 of us. And so we were all like bringing our own stuff. And I'd never been a part of anything like that before. Uh -huh. So I was just a massive sponge and I applied everything that I learned and I, I was able to grow the practice substantially that year. Mm. Nice. Okay. So <clears throat> you don't have money for the next step, which is your, really. your four PC entrance, Yeah. which is where you and I first meet. So yes. what, how do you cross that threshold? <laughs> so then it's like, ah, oh, I have another investment to make. Do I now believe mm that I will make it at least break even, if not make more money next year as a result. Uh -huh. And I, I wholeheartedly believed that I knew that I could squeeze a lot of value out of what Rich was putting out there because I've yep. already done it. So I thought, okay, well, I'm going to rub shoulders with these high 4% the of the top 4% the fucking universe. I was like, well, uh -huh. how could that be a bad thing? So I, I said, so I invested, I took more money <laughs> from our, yeah. And we, I invest, I knew it would be from your nest egg, basically, like where did you? Yeah. So yes, I had, we had money saved, uh, not locked away in retirement. We just had some emergency funds. Yep, so I took some kind of... out of there with the knowledge that I was more than likely to make that back very quickly. Like I mm. knew I just didn't have cash on hand. I knew I'd be able to replenish the coffers. I just. I was really confident. How'd it that. feel? It wasn't, it wasn't that scary, to be honest. Mm. I felt wrong because you're like, what kind of person does this? Yeah. But at the end of the day, it was, I mean, I, that was 100% the right decision. I mean, like I, I learned a ton in 4PC that year. Of, of course, in hindsight, you, you can yeah. see. And it sounds like, so in the moment, not that scary, but was there any, well, it sounds like if I'm hearing you right, there was some resistance to just like a story about what the right thing to do intellectually was yes. or something that you had to cross beyond. Cause yeah. I think that's really important. Like the fantasy I witness all of us go through is this idea. Like if like when it's the right time, there won't be any fear. And, yeah. and that's sort of true. Like if we wait long enough, eventually we're like, fuck this, I just have to do the thing, but that can be 20 years out. Yeah. And typically there's always like some edge, especially when it's a breakthrough territory we're pushing into, you know, like yes. beyond our old stories, there's never going to be a point for me. We're borrowing against the equity in our home because we were already six figures into debt to, to double down, you know, on the investment of, of, of being trained as a coach. There's never a point where that was going to be sensible. 
<laughs> the only way that that was going to be sort of safe for me was after I'd become a lawyer for 10 years, paid it all off. And then at that point, it's not going to have the same impact, right? Right. So yeah. you said it wasn't that scary. I'm just, I want to draw out if there's anything there, like to what extent was it a little edgy or like yeah. required a bit of you or, or was it just not the case in that instance? No, no, I had fear. And most of it was judgment of myself. The what kind of person uh -huh. question, like what kind of person takes every penny that she's made, which isn't much because I've already invested, like I've invested mm -hmm. a ton. Or, so I'm not actually generating a profit. Yeah. So I'm actually, yeah, yeah, yeah. you're generating revenue, still. but yeah. yeah, but I'm not, I have no profit at all. And so like with no profit, how dare I, I have two children. We have, well, I did before I launched the one thing uh, my husband and I did do is we paid off our mortgage before I, I went out on mm, my own Nice, because I yeah. knew that I would, I was already anxious and waking up in the middle of the night in a sheer panic. I like, there's no way I would have made it in yeah. three weeks if we had a mortgage payment. I, like if our, if our house was at risk, I don't think I could have done it. Um, anyways, it, it was more of a, a judgment. Aha. Uh -huh. What the hell kind of person? And like, it's my, my stupid, my deepest, one of my many deepest fears is like, you're stupid. This is going to show people that you're stupid. Was that, was the fear like of you being this way or was it like, oh, my, my parent, like, was it projected out or was it entirely like, oh, I'm, I'm, you know, how did it, it occur both. for you? Bit of both. I think at okay, that time it. it really was very much. I mean, I'm still fresh off of like trying to still get my dad's approval and acceptance. So I suspect that was still there. Um, and then like feeling really vulnerable that people would find out uh -huh. that I was not making any money. Uh-huh. And I've got, got it. you know, yeah. What Classic coach fear too, right? Like yeah. we're practicing authenticity. We, it's really important, right? We have to be yes. able, because our people are probably out there also putting forward the idea that they're making a lot of money when they're actually not. And then they're yeah. there. So they need someone to be able to model this powerfully. So, so you, you find the money, you, you double down, so to speak yeah. on this investment yeah. of being a coach, you take four PC. So currently it all sounds roses. Like yeah. why, why do anything different? So what leads you to work with Bay and I, and I know we're jumping a few things. Okay. There was the dojo. There was you working with Toku, all of that sort of stuff. Yeah. But like what ultimately led you into the forge? How did you find your way there from where you were and why? Okay. So for PC to me was, I learned a lot and it was at many times a really, really painful process. Mm. Uh, I didn't feel held. Uh, a lot of the time I was confronted a lot and in, in very, <clears throat> not, they, they felt sharp. Like I know you used that mm. word before, but like, it felt like I was constantly getting cut and sliced mm. versus <clears throat> reflected and shown something. Uh huh. This was your experience in 4PC? Yes. I see. So it, it benefited you but then also yeah. it felt not that a i don't harsh. learn but it I also see. felt like i'm not sure that those people those 30 or 29 people like i basically left at that point not joining again and saying that like they're not my people uh-huh just because i couldn't i at that time where i was developmentally in my process i could not i just couldn't connect with with people inside of that program. Mm. And, I, and I, you know, I'll take a lot of ownership for that. I, I was shut down most of the time. I was like scared of people. There was a lot of like cross, a lot of like unsupervised, like not permitted coaching happening. There was just a lot of sharp and like hurdy things that were kind of launched at you. Mm. Um, and it, it, I wasn't sure that that's like, at the end of the day, I never felt like I, I had more intimacy, more connection with the people inside. Right. So you created results in your business, but not yeah. huge. What you and I might refer to as the transformation you were yeah. wanting internally, the external results, a, maybe. Well, and I, I desperately wanted a community. Uh -huh. So hungry for that. Which is kind and of the I, promise of 4PC a little bit, right? Like you're going to be with these rock stars. Yeah. Yeah. Except 
I, I did not experience community inside of for PC. Mm. Uh -huh. I just experienced a lot of, a lot of really unmasterful, if that's a word, mm -hmm. things, coaching, maybe more feedback, maybe criticism launched at me all the time. So interesting because um, one of the tenets, you know, of that uh, group, I guess, was often like uh, no coaching without permission. I know. And as you know, in the forge, we we kind of part of the invitation you and I stand for people to step into is like to be a demand, right? Like an ongoing, yes. hey, I'm here to receive, like yes. bring it to me and then I will let you know when I'm a stop. Yep. It's interesting how sometimes those, um, those sort of blanket rules that are like, no, no coaching ever, you know, you set that up, it, yeah. it almost creates more fuzziness, because there's a part like, but we're here to give each other something. So what's, and then it becomes leaky, because it's it, it, leaky. Yeah, it's, this is such a weird concept, but like, it's going to be super clumsy, I'm going to shoehorn it in anyhow, get it in but there. There's, there's a road and there's a street. These are two distinct things. And a street is for walking along. And a road is for driving along at speed. So mm -hmm. when you're in a car on a road, you're, the intention is to move from one place to another at, at speed. A street is more pedestrian based and cars can move along it. And then there's this concept that exists called a strode. And a strode is neither street nor road. So in places that are like very car based, you have a lot of strodes where they basically have a strip mall. And it's sort of like you walk you along walk. it. Yeah. yeah, but then everything about the area, the way it's set up, kind of tells your brain this is a road you should be moving quick along it yeah. all of the accidents happen in the strodes they're the worst thing for traffic because it's made to have pedestrians move back and forth but people want to go fast and it creates this dissonance yeah. so it's a little bit like what you're describing is a little strode like where it's sort of like yeah. ah but we're all here as coaches and we're not meant to coach but then ah, and then we we kind of do it anyhow and it becomes yeah. leaky yeah Got yes. it. Okay. So back to you. I, I shoehorned yeah. it. Now I turned <laughs> well the done. back. Well done. And I loved it. I learned a thing. <laughs> yeah. So thank you. Uh -huh. uh, so then I left still hungry for community. I was pretty battered and bruised from that community as well. That is how, mm. that was my perception of how I left a little bit with my tail between my legs, a little bit like you people were dicks and I just, I uh -huh. want a community, but I don't want that one. But there were just I did not realize this at all. I mean, oh. you and I were in the program at the same time, and I was totally yeah. unaware that this was your yep. experience. Yeah. Yep. So then, you stick around for one year. Is that right? I think I did two. Yeah, that sounds right. Yeah, I think you were there I for did, two. I did do two. Um, yeah. And I'm going to start to unwind my my battery just that it's low. So if I have to switch over, you'll excuse. Oh, yeah, you, you bet. What happens. OK, so then I'm searching for community. I can't seem to find it. You were reaching out to me after I left uh, for PC, mostly to check in. Um, we would have a nice conversation. Yeah, we were just chatting, I, I think, to. at this point. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And, um, and then Toku was also checking in. Yeah, and our so friend Toku. He, he had asked uh, where I was at and then enrolled me into the dojo. So I went in. And at that point, you were not like, I don't think I ever saw you and Bay there, which is interesting because a lot of people were like, well, that's how I found Adam and Bay. And like, you weren't actually in it. Yeah, we were I just guest, guest teachers now and then. Okay. Yeah. So, um, so I did that. Then I worked with Toku for a year. I didn't find the samurai, the dojo to be, I, I liked the community, but it was virtual. Uh -huh. so I was still feeling a desire yep. for more connection. Uh, I loved the people I like that was getting closer. I was getting warmer in terms of like uh -huh. finding community. Those people were interesting. I'm, I'm still connected to several of them even today. So that's, that's been a nice um, finding. Um, and then I think it was Bay called and I said, um, I was still working with Toku and I said, do you have like a community, mm. like a community program? And she started to talk about the forge. It was also another one called, sorry, with an F on Facebook, maybe at one time. Oh, the forum, perhaps? Yes. Ah, yes. So there was that. And then there was like this actual coaching program. And I was like, well, I think that sounds really interesting. So that's how I landed. Mm. I, was like, I want to hear more about that. 
Aha, uh -huh, got it. And and so when I guess it was Bay, presumably, or my whoever it was, but like as you talked to us, like what what had you choose in? What did you hear or what enrolled yeah. you in this work? Oh, this is like four years ago. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I don't know if I have enough memory. Actually, let's see if it dies. Um And it's okay if you can't remember too. That's fine I, as well. I don't. I'm not sure I even remember. I remember asking, there were a few other people from 4PC that had done the forge. And I was like, oh, are they going to be in it again? So that would be interesting to like, you know, see some other people that I knew. Uh -huh. um, I don't know. I think I just, like, I trust you and Bay. I knew your, your coaching inside of 4PC was worlds different, mm. both you and Bay, than well, Rich, first of all, and mm -hmm. many of the other coaches. And I started to also notice um, people who had and had not been like formally trained. Uh -huh. to, I started to sense like there were differences. Right. So that was interesting to me because I thought, okay, well this, like, I wonder if there's more available to me here where I can have even more training by people who are actually trained. Uh huh. Um, so I know that was a that was a thing I was actually desiring and the community sounded really cool. It's a funny thing where like the coaching world, I think I've shared this before on one of these lives, but like the coaching world, you've got the International Coach Federation, the ICF, the body yep. which accredits coaches and that's important, but it's super stuffy and boring and stodgy and they always send out like ICF kind of emails and they're such a snore. They're so dull. And then, but they have the, I don't mean this in terms of social clout. I mean, like they have the legitimacy that comes from like, we got to put a fence around this thing called coaching. We've got to try to like, yeah. what does it mean to, to coach so that at least there's some boundaries on it. And then, so they do have that going for them. And then you have the like rock star fringe world of the coaching which is like a lot of what 4pc was these people that are like burning man cool dudes and dudettes yeah. but without it looks sexy and it's weird and out there and they're doing stuff and they're they're good marketers even just in terms of their personalities very naturally marketable but then there's lacking that grounding that like that training that embodiment of like some some principles, some systems behind it. And mm. there's not a good bridge. I mean, that's what we try to create in the forge. And I think there's other programs that do this, a bridge between those two worlds, as opposed to keeping them separate, because I like the sexiness and I don't like the boring stodginess of the ICF, mm. but I recognize the value in both of those. Coaching shouldn't be, you know, those conversations that we get into when we go to a networking event and we're like the person's like a coach and then we're talking to them and they're all their voice becomes very soft and everything's oh that's good you know and we're just like ah oh, fuck I feel like I'm being coddled and I'm drinking warm milk yeah yes was that a, a stabbing myself in the eye yeah fork knife what were you a using pen. Pen. A pen. oh yeah nice pen. Yeah. Pen. anything available whatever was around Sharp. it it was pointy yes. <laughs> yeah and so that's not there's no reason coaching can't be sexy and fun and exciting and delightful. And that's so much of what we want to impart to people is that like coaching is about life. And if no one wants, I don't want a life that sounds like this and that, and it's okay if someone else does, but we want it to be fun and joyful. So, yeah. so anyhow, um, it's, you're, you're starting to see the grab, you join the forge. So now we're into the part of your journey where you and I are working together. Bay, yeah. you, you know, you're with us. So, uh, hey, Drew, Drew is saying he thinks he needs to learn to be more sexy, but Drew's always posting thirst traps on Facebook, pictures of him with his shirt off. He looks great <laughs> playing horse. pickleballs. So yeah, I think <laughs> you need to tone it down, Drew. He's so not sexy. Less sexy. Yeah. Just uh, figure out whatever sexiness I'm bringing and then just do like a minus one. And that'll be great for my egoic uh, <laughs> capacity. So, so what you join us and then like, just give us whatever you want to share, like just your experience through mm -hmm. this first, maybe more than first year, but like, what are you starting to feel, learn, experience, notice, whatever. How was that year? I have to say the first year, um, I was really confronted again. Mm. 
which is not a good start to the story because you had left 4PC yeah, feeling confronted. And uh -huh. yet knowing, um, really trusting you and Bay to, um, what did I trust? I trusted that you guys were doing something valuable. So I, I stayed with mm. it, um, uh -huh. but I, I, um, like I didn't do the project. I didn't go to those calls. I didn't like really, really commit. I did it. It was like another program. So I'm just going to do that. Pro I paid my money. So I'll just show up when I can show uh -huh. up. And, and then I got some things out of it. And then there was the, the most confronting, one of the most confronting things I've had inside of the forge was that first year. And, um, I'll, I'll use their names because I, I think that I want them to know that they changed my life. Mm. The first one was Andrea Burke when she reflected to me that I, it was about my zippiness, but I think she used the word eager. Mm. And I fucking hated that feedback. This was when we were doing some blind spot work, right? Yeah. And, and it was remote because of COVID. And like having that done remote, I, I remember like being in my house and my daughter was home because she wasn't in school either. And like after that call, so, so it was reflected by Andrea. It was something about needy and eager. Um, and then Sarah, oh, and Sarah said, I, you don't come to any of those calls, the ones that I lead, and it makes me feel like you don't care. And that's mm. when I was like, I'm out. Fuck these people. Fuck mm. this program. Like, I am completely confronted. Like, I am now, I'm having an adrenaline response. It was like, I think I, blo I was getting blotchy, like on my neck. Uh huh. It now, was, was this was this stuff you didn't like? Was this brand new for you to hear this? No. Uh huh. Uh, the the not caring I've never heard that I know, uh -huh. but the 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 needy thing I'd heard before. Right. So it's, it's just like having it kind of pointed to right in front of your face is the hard part. Yeah, and then uh -huh. with other people witnessing that. Right. And then yeah. knowing that like I'm having an emotional reaction and everybody's going to see me having that re emotional reaction. And so like it was just real messy all in that moment. Yeah, it's really like this sort of stuff is um, it makes me think of, you know, 360 reviews. Of course, yes. everyone knows 360 reviews. Yes. The, and what happens with the 360 review is we we get it and then we read it. And of course, there's a bunch of good stuff, which we immediately disregard. Yes. Throw that out. Who the fuck yes. cares about that? Tell me <laughs> how I suck. Pick. Yeah. Tell yeah. me what sucks about me. But then we read that. And then typically what I witness people do is they're like, oh, yeah, I know that about myself. Yeah. And then there's like a, a, a degree of like, it's OK or I'm comfortable with it. Like, oh, yeah, I know that I'm crappy that way. And the difference here, it's sort of the difference between doing and being. We're here. The 360 review is doing it's giving you the doing of here's some feedback, yeah. but we're actually, when we're delivering feedback, the way you're describing, forcing you to be with that feedback, as opposed to just setting it aside because you already know that about yourself. Yeah. Anything and it, you want to add to that? Yeah. Um, well, I find that the, the, when we work with the being, we do two things. One is the, the reflection of like what we notice. Uh -huh. And then the second, which is, this is where it, you know, the heart, my heart just gets like, you know, backed over with a, a big truck is when someone shares with me the impact. Yes. And that's when I'm like, oh, fuck. Right. That's when I just want to hide, hit the disappear button. And I talk about my daughter being home because I remember getting off that call that day and going into her bedroom and being like, do you have a minute? And she's like, yeah. I'm like, I just need a hug. And I start, oh, I'm getting emotional. I started crying. Mm. I was like, I just got some really, really hard feedback today. Mm. And I'm just heartbroken about it. Mm. Yeah. And and that's really um there's a potency in that in in that like you the last thing on the world like the thing i know to be more true about you than anything is how much you care yes and and so the the if the thing i think that's so potent about that feedback is it's helping you see the difference between your intention and the impact you're having yes which is that's a level of nuance that always gets missed in things like 360 reviews where it's like, oh, well, I don't actually feel that way. So I don't have to versus like, no, 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 that's how you're leaving. That's how we're leaving people. And that's really hard to be with. Yes. Yes. Uh huh. So question here. Hmm. This isn't the first time you like, you know, you describe 4PC, you're getting bludgeoned, so yeah. to speak. Yeah. What 
had this aside from just trusting us is there anything else that had this land or be different in terms of your experience getting this kind of feedback for you or was it pretty much the same no no um the container is set up really beautifully in the forge mm. like it's it is a, a tight ass container like it is safe <laughs> i as much as it hurt for me to hear those words from andrea and sarah there's no doubt in my mind that those two women loved me then they love me today like no doubt i knew and know that they absolutely like had my best interests at heart in those moments mm. i never felt not never i rarely felt that in 4pc uh-huh yeah that's that's so and i mean as a member of our leadership team these days you support yeah. people to kind of to hold the container and to deliver this kind of feedback such that it can land like what i'm hearing you describe is the difference between we can we can tell someone to deliver the hard feedback yeah. but there's more to delivering that kind of feedback artfully that is more that is important than just delivering it you know there's like who am i being that's allowing this to land and um so that was your first it sounds like that was one of the first experiences in a container like like in the coaching world if i'm correct me if i'm wrong but mm -hmm. where you got this kind of feedback and you were held in such a way that you could let it in. Yes. And uh -huh. I will also say I did skip a step because I came to one of your intensives in Canada and I had that uh, yeah. experience there when I left David behind. Aha. Uh -huh. Aha. Uh -huh. Do you want to share briefly about oh, that? Oh, David. I still so sad about that. So um, I this was before I joined the Forge. You and, and they had an intensive in Victoria and I like raised my hand to be on the leadership team. So I showed up and I got to run some some of the, the work in the room. And then I was responsible for a certain group of people. And then that meant like at lunch and at dinner, we were kind of like, like we, we at least made sure everybody was corralled and we took them to a nice place and whatever, right? And I had a person in that group that um, I had a previous, I'd known him inside of the Rich Litvin community and, um, he, he broke my heart for lots of reasons and I found mm. it very difficult to be with him. Yes. And um, so I got my group together and he said he was going to go to the bathroom and I left mm. without him. Like I didn't even remember him. So we all went out for lunch and when we got back, I was like, oh my God, I forgot David. And it was after David had already shared some pains that he had had around abandonment and rejection and not being considered and then i did the thing well the thing happened i didn't it happened uh -huh. so then it's in that room now you and bay are leading this and you you worked you had created this container where i was able to work through that with david him being inside his pain and me being in my like shame and guilt and your embarrassment. pain oh my god uh -huh. I was mortified and both of us sitting across from each other and you were able to like help us to at least clean up the mess that got made. Mm -hmm. Completely innocently. Yeah, 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 yeah. absolutely. So, yeah. so much of this is um, like there's there's uh, the impact we're inadvertently having. Yes. Which we're not aware of, and and sometimes we're kind of vaguely aware of it, but we just don't fucking care because that's easier than like yes. feeling Absolutely. what's actually there to feel. You know, we layer apathy over top, which works until you get to whatever age you get to, where you're like, fuck, nothing matters, and I don't care about anything. But at least I'm ironically funny. <laughs> Everything's yes. a joke. Yes. Yeah. Um, but there's so there's being responsible for the impact we're having and then there's also like just being like practicing forgiveness with ourselves we're like fuck i didn't mean to do that i feel terrible about it that's the last impact in the world i want to have and it was a mistake yeah. and i got to let myself off the hook i can receive you know hearing from this person i can apologize and clean up but it's much easier i would even go as far as to say it's actually becomes possible to clean up once yeah. we've forgiven ourselves as long okay. as we're holding something on ourselves we can't really clean up over there because there's still a mess on this side of the fence so yeah yeah. So, okay. So edgy, edgy year, it sounds like, you know, like a lot of, a lot of stuff. So what has you stick Reading around? <laughs> yeah. What has you stick around and join our leadership team? And, 
and kind of anything you want to share just about your experience being on the leadership team for not one, but two years now, both as a mm-hmm. junior leader and then a senior. I landed at the end of the first year of the forge feeling um, like I had grown immensely and my Mm -hmm. clients were seeing a big change in what I was bringing into the space for them. Mm -hmm. So I felt it and they were reflecting that back. They were like, wow, you must have had, you know, you must have met with your group again because you're asking me, you're being, (laughs) you know, you're showing up differently. Right. And my business kept growing. So I was like, wow, Mm. you know, how, what, it just all felt like this, when I put all these pieces together, it really uh, creates a success for me, for clients, for business, all of that. So Uh I re-enroll another year um, and put my hand up for leadership. I I will always do that. So, and I want it, I'm really hungry for it because it's, it's the people I coach are all leading they're all in leadership roles. Uh-huh. So I also wanted that experience, more and more experience in leadership. So um, I also loved several members inside the Forge and um, a few of those people re-enrolled and one of them um, joined the leadership team at the same time. And so it was just like one of those conversations, like if you do it, then I'm going to do it. And if I do it, then you're going to do it. And it's going to be great. So, uh-huh. you know, it. I felt more like I was part of community Mm -hmm. and then that second year, it really started to develop. So. Got it. And so what's different for you between the first year, you know, where you're purely a participant and then the latter year or two years, what do you notice is different? Um, the, the latter years is a lot of, um, the development of, leadership, I think. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to answer the question. Um, Like coaching is a tool. And when it's used to develop and cause leadership, that for me is a fucking sweet spot I want to be in every day. Like I Mm -hmm. love that place. And I, I don't have, this is a place where I can like if I'm playing basketball and you're watching me and you're like, ah, you know, you're dribbling this way or you need to roll to your left or, you know, watch your whatever. I'm getting like real time feedback as uh-huh. I'm leading and coaching. And that, again, that is the way that I learn. Mm. For me, I don't know of a better way to do it. And I love you and Bay, and I love this community. I am now fully in love with everybody on the leadership team. I want all of us to live together. So like I, um, I keep coming back because you all mean a lot to me. Mm. Oh, it's, it's really, um, there's the, the concept of like, uh, the mastermind that's really been big for the last decade, I would say. Uh, someone must have written a book. Like someone must have written a really best-selling book that was like, use masterminds. Well, and everyone's like, mastermind's the answer. That's yeah. the silver bullet. Yeah. And um, the concept's a great one, right? Surround yourself with people that are committed. But the trouble is um, we need we need someone to hold that container yeah. such that we can't get away with stuff because we we naturally enroll each other in like the way our life is, you know, like, yeah. oh, don't, it's, it's the same reason, like <laughs> back when I got stoned all the time, I had another friend who like got stoned all the time. He was my go-to How guy. Weird. Yeah. Yeah. And, and like, <laughs> whenever one of us was like trying to like move on or take a break or, you know, whatever, I wasn't going to stand for that. If he was not smoking weed, I wasn't going to, I was going to, yeah. I was hoping he would break so I could get stoned with him and vice versa and it's just like there's nothing wrong and it doesn't to vilify any of that it's just to speak to how it's it takes a lot to stand it takes a lot to hold a container and it doesn't exist just in a friendship or just in a casual thing and that's um, part of what I love in the forage is there's the container that holds that community and that allows us to go to places that are deeply intimate and incredibly confronting, but also that really open us up and to let each other see ourselves in a light that is very rare. And then to celebrate that, to have a really good time and to be ridiculous and have fun together and, you know, to kind of 
exist throughout that spectrum as opposed to just being in one spot or the other spot and, and just hanging out there. Yeah. Um, so people, people often like people watched Mia's um, thing. Like I did one of these with her yeah. and she was talking about her journey on the leadership team. And then people reached out and were like, I want to be on the leadership team. So this is the part where you get to share like, maybe like, um, okay, but like, you know, what, 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 what are the, I guess the cautionary tales as mm -hmm. well as the awesome nary tales, whatever the word is. That's totally weird. Uh, let's see. I, um, I think it'd be really not naive, but like, how can you be on leadership team without really knowing what you're enrolling yourself into? So let's say like, I want to go be captain of the tennis team, but I've never played tennis or I've uh -huh. never played on a clay court or I've never played pickleball. And now we're right. So part of the, the first year and the beauty of the first year is, is similar with anything we do in the first year. It's like figuring the shit out. How uh -huh. do you get things done? What is this all about? What's required of me? What do I hate? What do I love? La la la. That whole first year, you know, we need, I believe I desperately needed that first year before, because I would have put my hand up for leadership the first year. I totally would have, if you yeah. would have asked, I would have been like, yep, because I always do. Uh, I, l let me add, oh, sorry, were you going to speak no, more about that first year? No. Nope. The other thing about it is like, it's very human. We want to jump to the top. Yeah. And um, part of leadership is like a willingness to be in the humility. You know, like the, 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 the stereotype, I guess, would be like the Kung Fu student who wants to be the master. And then the teacher for the first year just has them carry water. Yeah. That's all, that's your Kung Fu for a year. And it's really learning humility and just like, this is all there is for me to do. It's not that we're just having people carry water, but there is like, there's a gift in like, starting at the bottom, so to speak, and learning from the ground up. And that's so important in the coaching profession, because again, so many people gravitate towards the rock star area of coaching, which is like, fuck it, man, I was an executive for 15 years. I don't need training. I'm a master at this already. Boom. And that's fine. <laughs> Do anything you want. Yeah. But you actually haven't been trained. You need to learn this stuff. And so, yeah, so that's the first year. Back to I you. Will, well, and I'll share inside of what you said is what I really have developed. It started the first year and it has just continued to grow year after year is I can now be led. Mm. I can do it. Say more about that. I think that's so important. Yeah. And I, you guys used to say shit like that. And I'd be like, what are they even talking about? And now I, th well, we'll see. I if hear I that get a it. lot. Yes, yes. But without the people understanding it after, they're just like, I don't know what he's talking about. I don't know what the fuck is. <laughs> True. And then he used words like awesome, Mary, and I don't. <laughs> um, so I am a member, like, I'll just speak for an example. Um, I'm inside of a, a leadership development program that I, I lead, you know, things. And inside of that, there's many of us. We're all basically contractors that they bring in for different parts of the program. And, um, I've been there now two and a half years and my first year I wanted to show everybody what a great fucking leader I am mm. because like they should know that. Uh huh. And if I have to keep telling people that maybe I'm not anyway. So I go in and I'm like, I'm going to show them what a great leader I am. And the irony was that it was like maybe last year where I really started to stand back and allow myself to be led. Uh huh. But that's when my leadership showed up which is like, uh -huh. you know, like, what is she talking about? It's like the, the, it's so counterintuitive that by allowing myself to be led actually had me showing up more inside my own leadership and people were more receptive to me leading them as well. There's like a, it's interesting as you're sharing this, one of the things I'm, I'm thinking about is like, even when we're leading, developing someone's leadership, leading, yeah. right. Developing someone's leadership. Uh, there is, continual moments through that process where we actually have to surrender and let them lead us. Yeah. Even if it's just like, oh, I'm telling them one thing and they're saying something different. I need to set aside what I know in this moment and really get over there with them to understand them fully. That's a, a moment where I'm like, I'm letting you lead me. Mm -hmm. And and a moment where this person is learning to be leader. 
we're yeah. we're in the dynamic of creating leadership even in that very moment even yeah. if it looks nothing like we think it will yeah. and you're so right allison like there's so many moments where people i'm the leader i'm powerful i'm going to show them all of that is unavailable from yeah. that place you know yeah uh-huh so please uh, so so learning to be led yeah was there anything more um no just that 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 was a beautiful uh gift that i wasn't even looking for mm. i didn't know i was looking for uh-huh i have uh two thoughts the second thought the first one i'm gonna have to retrieve from deep storage it's gonna okay. come to me though the second thought is after i've retrieved the first thought i'd love for you to share about this year and the breakdown and how we held you at the start of this year, you know, just with regards yeah. to the leadership program you're leading and all of that. So we'll come to that. Okay. The first thought was um, something that I'll remember after we talk about the thing I just said. So tell us about like, because I think what I love about this story you're going to share is that it, we all love the concept of having our leadership developed when it exists as a concept. Yeah. It's like, fucking cool. Who wouldn't go for that? Right. But in those moments when it's actually like, oh, now we actually have to practice leadership in the moment, it's usually not so fun. So describe how this, this yeah. year began and, and what came out of it. Um, so I, at the end of the second year of the Forge, had already enrolled to be on leadership team again for the third year. Uh -huh. Yeah. So I'm already in and I just also, to give people some surrounding and Allison stepping into senior leadership role, which means she's now develop. we're training her to develop the leadership of people stepping into leaders. So yep. she's kind of doing what we've been doing to her like up a to this point. Scheme, essentially. That's right. Yes, exactly that. So okay. it's, that's an easier way. It's just like what Bernie leadership. Madoff did, but for leadership. <laughs> uh, so, um, okay. So I've committed to the forge. And then I get this opportunity to be a part of this leadership development program that I'm, I want to be a part of. It's kind of a big deal. And they've asked me and I, I say yes. And then I'm super psyched. So I've got the forge coming up. I've got this leadership development coming up. And at, I don't remember exactly when this happened, but I'm looking at my calendar. I'm like, oh shit. The forge is on this day. It's a full day or no forge is two hours a day on Wednesday. And the leadership development program is one day a month on a Wednesday that is the same day at the forge. And I was like, well, I guess I can't do the forge. So then I'm like, hey, Adam and Bay, I'm so sad. I can't do it. And this I, is, this is, uh, we'd sent you all the dates. You had all of that prior to probably, even. Probably, but I hadn't. Yeah. It on the like I didn't, <laughs> you know. It's right. None of that was a consideration at this moment. It was just like, yes, here's the opportunity. I'm going to do it. Yes. Uh -huh. yeah, and it pays. So I had yeah. to say yes. Like what yeah. kind of person doesn't say yes to this? This is the right uh -huh. way to do it. So I've got all that. And then you guys are like, so I, I write you, I don't think I call, I think I send you a text. I'm like, Oh, I'm sorry, Mal. Bye. Love you. And uh, somehow we end up on a call. And I think the one call I remember was I don't remember who, I think it was Bay, and she was saying something like, well, so that's interesting. Like you committed to, to us. And I was like, yeah, I know, but like, this is a paying gig. And she's like, mm -hmm. yeah, got it. So um, you committed to the forge. I was like, yeah. So like, we're just going to over and over again. So in the course of all of this, there's, there's several conversations with both of you um, around. So are, you've made a commitment you're on the leadership team and you are now telling us you are no longer able to keep that commitment. And so wondering, are you open to possibility? And at that point, I know what that means. The question everyone hates. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You're like, I remember thinking like, I think I said it. I'm like, well, if you can figure out how I can be in two places at once, uh, yeah, I'm open to it. And so we have some conversations around like what is actually possible? What else could be, what else could we do? Is there a way? To, fi to figure out a win for everybody. Uh -huh. And in the midst of all of that, I'm really wrestling with bowing out for two hours. I'm supposed to be in this room with these leaders doing the stuff. Can I leave for two hours and then come back? Is that possible? Okay. Yeah. And if it's possible, and then you send me, it was an email, I think, with 
I sent you my spreadsheet. I sent, of course, I have a spreadsheet. I made a spreadsheet yeah. about the thing, and I sent it to you, and you were like, neat. And then you <laughs> asked me questions because I, I had the logistics, I had the tactics yeah. figured out. Yes. And you were like, yeah, good for you. And what about all of this? And it was like you added questions inside the spreadsheet. Masterful, by the way. And for somebody like me, you were like speaking my language. I was like, he fucking gets it. <laughs> Those questions have me sobbing. And mm. like really getting in touch with, holy shit, if I pull this off, not only will they be better leaders, my group that I'm with in the university, yeah. but God, what, like, what does this even expose for me? And how can I do this inside the forge? And what can I role model? Like it's, it blows up. So suddenly now I'm like, oh my God, this is massive possibility. And I get really excited about it. Mm. Can I, so let's, let's. Um, walk through all of this because there's so much juice in this and I really want to like open it up. Feel okay. free to interrupt me at any point to like interject whatever sure. you've got. That's really important. So the first thing that we're supporting in Allison or anyone and ourselves too, we come into confrontation, confrontation. There's got to be a weirder way I can say that word. Confrontation Maybe. with this confrontation. <laughs> the first, one of the first things we come into confrontation with in in our leadership is our commitment, our relationship to commitment, all of that. And the way that goes is we say, I'm a yes to this, but really what we're saying inadvertently is I'm a yes to this until something better comes along. Yeah. So it'd be like if Martin Luther King was like, million man march, we're gonna do this. We're, I have a dream, I've got the speed. Ah, you know what though? There's actually like a free trip to Bermuda. So we're gonna do this another, now's not the time, you know, that would just not work. Right. And people are like, yeah, but Adam, I'm not Martin Luther King and I'm not leading emancipate, you know, any of whatever that is. But that's not the point, because what we're training in someone in terms of their quality of being as a leader is the ability to bring that level of commitment to anything they do, such that when when someone gives their word that they will do something, there is a power behind it. So right. that's the first part. Now, that doesn't mean you always do the thing. We're going to yeah. come to that in a sec, right? That's yeah. important too. Yeah. But what it means is that once someone makes a commitment to this kind of work with us, and once they almost inevitably create a conflicting uh, yes. commitment, what happens is they're like, well, it's this or it's that. And that's yeah. where we have to do some work. And it's all uncomfortable for all of us. Like when you wrote that email, we were like, ah, fuck. <laughs> Why can't this work just be easy? Yes. It can be easy. We just have to relate to it that way. But it, you know what it is. It's yes. like someone sends an email and you're like, ah, oh, fuck. One, yeah. of my, one of my best friends just sent me an email um, where someone in a program she's leading just sent a quitting email too. And so it, it happens all over whenever we're developing. Hey, a letter. Yeah. <laughs> totally. By the way, I'm not doing that thing. Yep. So our job, the, the easy thing would be one of two paths. Path one is wow, Allison, that's so great. You got this opportunity. We're really going to miss you. Mm -hmm. But yay you for that thing. No stand for right. Allison's commitment. We're basically just folding our stand for her. We're not making it about us, which is okay, but we're not really standing for Allison to create any kind of break. Right. Way easier for both of us, right? Oh, 100%. You don't get to do the thing, but oh well. Yeah. There's not going to be any breakthrough for Allison. Next right. time the same thing happens, it's just going to be once again choosing one or the other. Yeah. The other path we can hold is, fuck you. You said this, you have to do this. Right. And so that is kind of like holding you to the rule, yes. but there's probably not going to be a breakthrough there because you're just going to, you, you're folding at that I'll point. I'll get defensive. Yeah. Yeah. And, and maybe you. you say yes to stick with the forage, but you do it from a place of resentment and fuck you. And you hold on to that for the rest of the year. And yes. You know, next time you just maybe don't tell us or maybe just don't say yes to things. No breakthrough again. Right, right. And in neither of those paths does Allison's word, her her capacity to have power behind her word as a leader grow, right? Correct. Anything you want to add to that, what I've laid out so far? No, because that's exactly where and how and, and what I then wrestled with, uh -huh. not jumping ahead, but what I wrestled with the entire third year inside the forge. <laughs> right, so, right. Yeah. So, so now our job or Allison's job, if she's standing for people in our, in our first year leadership, yes. our job is to say, well, Allison, you made a commitment here. 
not because it really matters what she committed to or because the forge is the most important thing in the world, but because Allison came to us and said, I want my leadership developed. Yeah. And because we said we are committed to developing your leadership for you. So both of us are going to step into this harder, more annoying place to be, which is called standing for someone. <laughs> standing for Allison's power of commitment as a leader. And so the way we do that is we say, okay, well, you made a commitment. And it sounds like you've created a breakdown. You said yes to this other thing. <laughs> was that was twice you said things. yes? Well, no, two I said things. yes to two things that happen at the same time. Yes. Yeah. And so we want to support Allison to see one, how she created this. How did this happen? You had all the dates yeah. from the forge. What happened? And do you remember, like I remember, but do you remember part of the energy that had you kind of created this way? No. So it was kind of like a scarcity thing, like, oh my God, they're choosing. Yeah, okay. Does that ring a bell now? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Do you want to share a bit about that? So inside of the other program, it was a big deal that uh -huh. I was going to be a part of it, that I was being asked. And it was a pretty big role yeah. and that I saw that, like, if I said no, if I pushed against, if I um, asked for any flexibility that that then they'd kick me out of the club, right? That uh -huh. I, I would get shoved out. Yeah, this is such a precious golden offer that if mm -hmm. I try to negotiate, I, I can't do any, I can't disturb the delicate bird. I just have to say yes. Yes, Uh huh. Yeah. I treat it very fragile. Yeah, so this is what's happening here for everyone listening is that Allison is, and interrupt if you have it differently, Allison, but I think it's sort of that you were, relating to them as the ones with the magic, not you, your leadership, isn't that like Alice is relating to herself kind of small. Yes. Fair. Yes. Yeah. Like the, the, um, the way that it occurred to me is that like, like Sally field standing on stage and being like, you like me, you really uh -huh. like me. She's holding her award. And it's like Sally field girl. Yes. Yeah. You earned that award. You're amazing. Right. Uh, hey, Seth, Seth says he's feeling empathetically uncomfortable with these stories. <laughs> I think if I remember correctly, Seth's going to join us this year in the Forge. Don't worry, Seth, the awesome. first year you don't have to do any of this. <laughs> first year you're just learning about this stuff. So you, you can not worry about it. Um, so, but it is, it is uncomfortable, isn't it, Allison? Oh, yeah, it was awful. Uh -huh. I was, you I and was I have... really mad at you guys. Uh-huh, totally. Like, as if. Yeah, and, and... Um, both of us have been in this, like you and I have been in this place. It's uncomfortable. It's frustrating. Yes. What shows up is our indignance or fuck you. You don't understand, yes. you know, all of that shows up because from where we're sitting, not yet on the other side of our breakthrough, it's all true. Fuck you. I really don't have a hand to play here. I really have to just say yes to them. And so what we brought to you, Allison, was sort of like, where you were at was like, well, I have to choose one or the other because right. I can't negotiate and right. you guys aren't going to negotiate with me because you're standing for my dumbass commitment. So either I do this thing or I do that thing. This thing is such a rare opportunity. I guess I'm not in the forge this year. And, yeah. and what we brought, you know, what was in the cells of that spreadsheet. I was just asking Allison questions that were like doing what we would call exploring possibility. What if it was possible to create both of these? Yeah. What if it was possible in terms of your leadership not to have to choose one or the other? What if showing up on the forge for those two hours actually deepened your work with these people? Actually, yes. rather than taking away from it, yes. enhanced, you know, yeah. all of that sort of stuff. Yeah, yeah it was good. Uh-huh. Yeah. And that kind of asking those questions is not, it's not hard questions. Like the magic in doing that is not that like, I had a special book or I have a brilliant brain. I do, but like, it wasn't that I have a brilliant brain that knows the right questions to ask. It's that right. someone has stood for me this way. And all they've done is said, well, Adam, you've created this conflict and you're holding that you have to have one or the other, but what if it was possible to have both? And I'm like, fuck you. I can't have both. Right. And, and from being stood for that way and then walking through it, then we can turn around and see it so clearly with other people when they're creating the same thing. Yes, we can. Uh -huh. Maybe even people inside the forge last year. For uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, totally. Because yeah. it's always the way, right? Like Talk you walk way. through this, create this breakthrough. And then of course that happens in spades in our, in our, uh, yeah. in our leadership group. 
Anything else you want to share about this process that we've just kind of gone through? Um, so it, it, well, it's, what do I want to share? I, this feels off topic. I'm going to share it anyways. The process of having to create and generate inside the forge and in this program on the same days, sometimes at the same times and trying to manage all of that was also super confronting. Aha. Uh -huh. And I can say that I've already now started my next cohort at the university program, and I'm already leading this group totally differently mm. as a result of what I learned last year. So it has already transformed how I'm going to do the next year with this next cohort. Uh -huh. And you already know this, but your listeners might find it interesting that all of that, what that did for me was my husband and I had a massive breakdown inside the marriage. We've had so many, but like, mm. ah. but over the six years, like we've had teenagers that were in some sort of like, you know, coming unraveled and whatever. And so that's, that's pretty stressful, a lot of crises and la la la. But then we're like trying to find our way back to each other. And then my husband has a massive, like, I find something out that I'm like, wait, what? Like 10 years? And I didn't uh -huh. write. And it was, be I believe that because of my experience in the forge that I was able to be like, okay, it isn't this and it isn't that. Like, uh -huh. what can we create where we both can move forward regardless of how conditions have just changed? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, that there was a lot of, um, a lot more, I, I use the word significance a lot. I think that's what I really developed last year was like really checking the significance of things. Like, is it that significant? It's significant. Does it have yeah. to be the most significant thing that's ever happened in the world? No, it doesn't have to be. Uh -huh. And how can I now generate and create something new with my husband that works for him and works for me? What does that look like? Yeah, it's it's so interesting how, like, you know, there's the saying shit ain't that deep. And there's like yeah. a lot of wisdom to that. And then, but I find a lot of the work for me, maybe you experience this too, is like intellectually, I know that truth. But yeah. internally, I still emotionally have significance about the stuff that happens. And the only way I, I move shit ain't that deep or whatever the affirmation is, the mantra, the only way I move it from an intellectual knowing where it's it at best, it's a layer of veneer. That's yeah. whenever we're trying to apply something like that intellectually, it's painting glitter on a turd. It's not yeah. that it's wrong to begin there. It's just not the end of the journey. And most right. of us end our journey there, you know, yes. yeah. just reframe and find a positive. No, that won't work. The only way we move that affirmation or that mantra from intellectual to like a lived experience is by walking through it, yep. by having those moments, being like, fuck, this is super significant, yeah. sitting with it, and then like kind of coming through to the other side through support like this. Yeah. And then the beautiful thing this year, I think you're already out in front of having those conflicts, right? Maybe Which not, conflict? maybe this word with like the, the leadership work you're doing, like oh, at the university. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, first of all, <laughs> we're doing Tuesdays now. So that's handled. amazing. That's yeah. handled. That's great. And I am already putting things into the space that is to create a deeper level of leadership inside the room by mm. virtue of me not leading. Amazing. Yeah. Again, allowing myself to be led. Uh huh. And, and holding space for others to step up into it, like creating space for others. Yeah. There's like, um, a lot of people want to, like, I want to be able to, you know, like, I don't know, I'm just gonna sort of riff a bit, but like, I wanna be able to ask for what I want. Mm -hmm. And great, that's an amazing thing to play for. What we're hoping is that if we read enough, enough books, if we do enough things, eventually we'll arrive, like we'll just sort of wake up and be like, oh, I'm now ready to ask for what I want. I've got enough clout, I've got enough mm -hmm. certifications. But the real way we get to that place is through the process you just shared, yeah. where we make a commitment in a container like the Forge or whatever it is. We <laughs> don't ask for what we want. We create a mess, a breakdown, yeah. 
yes. which is a beautiful thing. Yes. And then we're stood for to create the breakthrough. And on the other side of that, we learn, oh, fuck it. I'm not going to go through that again. I'm going to ask for what I want. Yes. And yes. sometimes we don't learn that and we go through it again. <laughs> Yes, and that's true. Too. And, and that. both, like sometimes yeah. I will and sometimes I won't. But in this yeah. case, yes, and and very much inside the marriage now that that's been the practice now is to ask for what I want and making requests and yeah and and then the mind fuckery of the reason that I didn't is because I was afraid of rejection. But what is actually true? What's underneath that? And the big surprise was when I asked for what I want from my husband and he gives it to me. I stop. I just mm. press because. Mm -hmm. I think there's a sense that like I'm a burden. And so now there's a whole new like. <sighs> oh, that's why I wasn't asking for what I wanted because I might get it. And that, ha yeah, totally. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. I love how this work is fractal in the sense. And I think yeah. you know what I mean by this. You I know, do. like we yes. Ooh, go yes. through one layer and we're like, oh my God, I got there. And then it's like, now there's a new version of the same thing. And yeah. it's not, it's not that the rewards aren't sweet. Oh, you know, amazing. like every breakthrough is just, oh, it's the nectar of life. There's nothing better. Yeah. Maybe an orgasm, but, you know, close second. Those are good too. Yeah. It, well, it's like a long orgasm, <laughs> you know. Yes. Yes. And you want many. With some that. pain in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> Gross. But, you know, like we, we create those breakthroughs and it's just amazing. And what I love is how it shows up in so many different, you know, like we, you created around leadership with a company you're working for or university you're doing stuff with and the forge. And then it shows up almost unexpectedly in other areas of your life. You're like, Oh my God, my relationship with money is changing or, or yeah. things are shifting with my wife and, and yeah. how we're being in one place of our life. When we change that, it changes how we're being in every place in our life. Yeah. And that allows all this stuff to grow and shift. And that's just amazing. I love that yeah. stuff. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Allison. So as we wind down, yes, sir. How do people find like tell people about what you do as coach? Like, who are you as coach? Who do you work with? What do you do? Anything like that that you want to share? Yeah. So I uh, I'm I work with executives and I work with executive teams. So mostly small to medium sized businesses. I don't usually work with big corporations. Um, and what I size is small? Like, how do people know if they're on that that 300, size? Three hundred, three hundred or less. Uh huh. Got it. Yeah. Um, I'm really, really good if you have a partner. So if you mm. work with your a spouse or you work with a partner in some way and there is some things in between that you haven't touched on, that is my sweet spot. And that's why executive teams are also a sweet spot for me because usually people on the team are holding something on each other uh -huh. that, like that we don't want to talk about. And I'm able to, I'm really good at coming in and allowing and creating space where people can talk about it and they can work through that. Um, I also run a group. I run a coaching mm -hmm. group. And those are typically people who have been clients that want to continue with me. And then they mm. feel hungry for community, much like I was. And so I now yeah. have a community for people. And uh, the third thing that has been like a happy uh, discovery is uh, I do a lot of keynotes now. Yeah, and I love it. I'm having so much fun. So that's so cool. Yeah. So, uh, and you also wrote a book, right? One or I've two? I've two books. Two, yes. yeah. Um, and I've done a TEDx. Let's see, what else have I done? I'm about to go hike Nepal for two mm, I didn't know that. Back. What are you doing? Are you doing Kilimanjaro? Uh, Is that no. in Nepal or Tibet? No, Himalayas. Himalayas, that's what I'm thinking of. Yes. Yep, are in Nepal. Kathmandu then. Kathmandu. Yes. Yep. So yep. we'll start there. Uh, anyway, so we're going to do a portion. We're going to start where Annapurna starts, but then we're going to veer off in a back portion called the Narfu Valley. And we're going to do Narfu. that trek. It's like 12 days. Cool. Yeah. I, I, I just got back from a wedding in uh, there's Denver, the mile yeah. high city. Then yeah. there's Boulder, which is a bit higher. Yeah. And then there's Thailand. Netherland where we were, oh, okay. which is about for Canadians, three kilometers, 9,000 feet above yeah. sea level. Yeah. And like a couple things, and then we're going to come back to you. But okay. first rolling over in bed left me out of breath. Yeah. <laughs> like roll over and be like, all right, let's just gather ourselves. <laughs> Second, my nose was so dry. Yeah. I figure that people in Netherlands must feel that tourists are just disgusting because all I wanted to do was live with my nose, my finger up my nose, pulling out these shards. Yes, of dry, dry boogers. Yes. Totally. You're like, you want to blow your nose? I'm not going to work. There's I got crystal there. meth crystals ah. up there. It's not going to do anything. <laughs> yeah. Miserable. So yeah. you doing that is wild. That is awesome. It's sure, especially since I live at sea level. 
Aha, uh -huh, yes, me as well. Aha, uh -huh, yeah, it's good. I like living at sea level. Yeah. Where do people find out about you? Where do they go oh. to learn about your stuff? So uh, I have a website. So the website is bethoughtly.com. Um, I do B E T H O U G H T L Y, right? Dot com. Yes, okay. Yep. And then, um, I also have a podcast, um, called unhooked. So mm. Mia, Mia, if you got to watch one of Adam's previous interviews with a celebrity, so Mia and I run a podcast now called, how long unhooked. has that been going for? That's amazing. Since, um, May. We did our very I can't believe one. that you haven't, I guess the forge is just finishing, but we got to make yeah. sure that that is included we didn't in the resource until after the forge. And cool. I'm, so that's been really fun. And then you two um, must be a gong show. Whole, that must just that's be what I said. That is our whole vision. She, she, we built out like, why are we doing this? And my reason was because we are fucking hilarious. That's why it's the uh -huh. reason why, and it's just fun. So, um, yeah, our first episode is about, um, it's it is Cinco de Mayo. That's what it is. And I'm talking about tacos. And then Mia says taco. And that's that is where that's <laughs> the episode. Begins. Yeah, it's her talking. Well, you're about, saying it correctly. Yes. And then she has a British accent and then she doesn't really know what it is. And then off it goes. So anyways, uh, -huh. uh we have that so that you can find on Apple. Um, my son's in charge of it. He was supposed to be putting it onto Spotify or you can go onto YouTube and you can see us there. And then I used to have a lot of social media presence. I decided not to do that anymore because it's a pain in the ass. So yes. if you want to find out about me, go find me on LinkedIn. Uh -huh. LinkedIn is the, the place that you're kind of most. That's that's alive. where I found the the audience that cares about what I put out. Yep. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Uh, and then you're coming back this year again to yes, support us, to lead, to develop leadership, to model leadership in the moment. So mm -hmm. uh, Allison is with us in the Forge, along with Mia, along with a whole bunch of awesome people. Yes. Um, so check out Allison's book. The first one was called uh, what was it? It was think possible yes the problem with having too many ideas yes basically yeah what yes. was the proper sub uh, subtitle? let's see i don't even remember i'm kind of embarrassed about this book now the light and dark side of never running out of ideas i'm gonna see you if i've got copy? my embarrassed book oh adam i have i have your copy right here and i was also going to pull out the book i wrote that i'm embarrassed of which is actually our, our books are kind of similarly titled mine's too smart to know better <laughs> leadership for the smartest the people, people in the room and then i wrote a book after um, I wrote that one, because that one was like, that wasn't so bad. So then I wrote another book that I'm not really sure has a lot of value, but I loved writing it because it's with my daughter, Piper. So she's uh -huh. in this picture. My son took this picture and it's called Unconditional Hold Learning to Navigate. Hold it up closer. Uh, yes. Oh, cool. That's you and Piper? Yeah. Sweet photo too. Yeah. So... Yeah. Um, and that's really about like, if your kid is struggling with mental illness and like, Nobody had a book. Uh -huh. There was just no book. And so I, I'd written that as part of like my journey um, and then waited until Piper was ready to put, she put some of her, her journalings in there. So it's really a book about like, what the fuck? Like if you feel, if you're in the middle of this, you're lost and you feel like you're the worst parent or you don't know where to turn. That's what that mm. book, I mean, that book is, isn't a resource as much as it's just like, hey, you are not alone. And here's some things that we found that were helpful, but essentially like, it sucks. Uh -huh. Being seen, feel, yeah, totally. So important. Yeah. Yeah. I The way you described um, Think Possible and the way I described my book, I, I kind of felt like the first book I had to publish just yeah. to like uncork, you know, like yeah. I, I had to, I didn't really, I was ready to walk away from it, but I was like, if I do that, then I'm going to continually be here. And in order to publish the book, I, I'm really here to publish next. I got to just put this into the world and let a almost it be a shitty first draft that I've spent two years on. So yes. yeah. yeah, same thing. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Thanks for being here, Allison. Um, so for everyone um, listening, if you're interested in, in anything Allison is putting into the world, I highly recommend you follow her on LinkedIn, check out her website, read her books, definitely check out that podcast. I'm going to do the same thing because her and Mia are just ludicrous. So that's going to be awesome. <laughs> Um, and then if you're interested in the forge, you can send me a message, you can mail me, you can even probably reach out to Allison yes. and just be like, Hey, can you tell me a little bit more? Or I'm curious about this or 
this is where I'm at. Can you like, what do you think for me would be a good fit? You can ask any of us of, of those sort of questions. We're happy to support you. And um, and I think next week, am I solo next week? Oh, I'm solo next week. That's what? exciting. I've not been solo for a while. So next Friday, we're kicking, we're back to the regular scheduled programming. I'll be solo. We'll be talking about distinctions and, and audience suggestions for questions and stuff like that. Thanks everyone for tuning in. Good group this uh, this Friday. Thank you, Lydia, Jess, uh, Drew, Seth. Who else do I want to give a shout out to? My cool peeps. There was uh, America, Rocky, Sarah. Anyone I'm missing? That's as far as I'm going to scroll back. Thank you everyone for tuning in. We love you. Have an amazing weekend. Happy Canada Day to everyone, both Canadian and not. We'll catch you all soon. Bye-bye. And then I got to click. 